today we are having a special event, uh, a, which is a panel discussion about Terragon Season Theater Season One. Terragon Theater Season One. That's um, and just for so the people uh, up here, who are, these are the first and second year students of the theater, of the George Brown Theater School, uh, and they're in the acting program. These are all people who are uh, planning to be uh, actors. So, uh, as you guys know, my name is Alex Paulus, uh, and I'm your theater history instructor. <laughs> Shot in England, a 
According to Robin, it was so low budget and the crew was so inexperienced that the craft people thought they could feed a crew in the cast of about 40 with a two slice toaster and a bowl of coffee maker. Every time they used it, they blew the set lights. Funny if it had if we hadn't been so much. <laughs> and the two. talking a bit about that this morning with the second year class about what uh, what job descriptions mean at, at a particular point in the history of a company, I think, would be a, a useful thing. And also this goes along with this about job descriptions and so on. He, there were four co-artistic directors or co-associate directors or whatever, whatever, however they were named in the first season, and uh, uh, Bill Glasgow. Steve Winston Smith, Brian Neeson, and Jimmy Douglas, Jim, Jim Douglas. So we're lucky to have Steve here as one of those first core uh, uh, artistic associates, whatever we want. However, and I think we can, uh, it would be great to hear sort of how that de definition sure. worked and didn't work. Because <laughs> I'm sure that it was uh, both. Um, he was a member of the Jest Society, an improv comedy company that later formed the basis for the Royal Canadian Air Force. Steve was lucky enough to be included as an actor in a festival of Canadian plays, which was a factory theater initiative that was sent to London, England, and played in and he played in the, uh, the important early Canadian work, a Canadian play, Esther Mike and his wife Agdell. A few years later, Bill Glasgow hired him as his assistant when he was appointed artistic director at Center Stage, uh, and Steve has also acted in film and television, including such shows as Seeing Things, Friday the Thirteenth, Net Worth, and, a, and had a recurring role on Street League. Steve is currently idle, but of course open to offers. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody else in the theater business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Steve's left is Mallory Gilbert. Um, and Mallory, you, you went to the you're American by birth and went to college in the United States, correct? Yes. And then you moved to Canada in what year, do you remember? 67. 67. And I never got to and you never got to Expo. No, not two things. <laughs> uh, so, and from 1967 to 1972, Mallory worked in various positions, including stage manager and producer for professional and non-professional theater companies in Toronto. In 1972, she was named theater manager at Tarragon Theater. In 1975, her job title changed to administrator, and in 1978, to general manager. She stayed with this title until her retirement from Tarragon in 2006. She is one of Canada's preeminent theater administrators <coughs> and has had a strong impact on the development of strong, consistent theater company organizations throughout Canada. She has been the president of the Professional Association of Canadian Theaters, PAC, as well as a board member for 20 plus years. She has been on the advisory board of the George Brown Theater Arts Program. Uh, she has served on countless juries, panels, and advisory boards for the Canada, Canada Council, the Ontario Arts Council, the Metropolitan Cultural Arts, uh, Cultural Affairs, the Toronto Arts Council, Theatre Ontario. She is a founding member of Creative Arts, the, of the Creative Trust for Arts and Culture, and is currently its president. She has also served on the Mayor's Roundtable for, for Arts and Culture. And you think actors get to win a lot of awards? <laughs> you know, Gemini's and Torah's and all this sort of stuff. Now, <laughs> has won the Brenda Donahue Award for Achievement and Contribution to the Toronto Theatre, the Gaskell Thomas Award given by the National Theatre School. The Joan Chalmers a National Award for Arts Administration, the Canadian Canada Conference of the Arts Cal Keith Kelly Award for Cultural Leadership, the Toronto Theatre Alliance Silver Ticket Award for Astounding contrib Outstanding Contribution to the to the theatre, which means she doesn't have to pay for theatre in Toronto. Uh, ever again, uh, uh, the William Kilborn Award for Celebration of Toronto's Cultural Life. In 2007, she was made a member of the Order of Canada. In 2006, PAC and Tarragon Theatre established an annual Mallory Gilbert Leadership Award, which is an award to an individual who has demonstrated outstanding leadership within the Canadian theatre community. <coughs> Currently, Mallory is working as an arts consultant for organizations such as the Ryerson Theatre Department, Theatre Pass Marais, Shadowland Theatre, the Barry Arts, arts Council, Thousand Islands Playhouse, Theatre Rustical, Toronto Mass Theatre, Theatre to Be, and the Blind Festival. <laughs> we should see your black bear. <laughs> and to enter Mallory's left is Richard Carson. Uh, 
Richard started at Tarragon as a volunteer and was taken on to the tech staff in the fall of 1971. He spent four or so years on the tech staff working on set crew, lighting, but his main responsibility was sound. He also did some assistant stage management and even some acting in the production of Sticks and Stones. In 1974, a group of actors who were working on the James Rainey Donnelly trilogy at Tarragon formed a company called the NDWT Company so that they could tour the three Rainey plays across Canada. Richard drew, drew the short straw and became company manager of NDWT. <laughs> Following an 11 week coast to coast tour of the three Donnelly plays and Hamlet, the NDWT company settled into the Bathurst Street Theatre as a home base. Uh, that tour, I think, is another important sort of landmark in Canadian theatre, as it was one of the first times that a company touring Canadian work went from coast to coast as a single event, uh, with these three uh, plays by a Canadian author, that all around the, the story of the Donnelly family. Um, and you can read more about this tour in the book, 30 Barrels from Sea to Sea by James Rainey, which again is a, sort of an important um, administrative document in sort of the, the life. It includes a lot of reviews of the tour, etc., etc., and stories of things that happened on tour. Um, NDWT was primarily a touring company, however, and while touring the North, Richard had the chance to meet people, organizations, and communities in Northern Ontario. Around 1980, he moved to Sioux Lookout to work with Wawate, a native language newspaper helping to develop community radio and native language television in the remote communities of Northern Ontario. He also started a theater company called Northern Delights, based in Sioux Lookout, and toured to isolated communities. All sets and gear had to be designed so that it could fit into a single water aircraft or the belly of a Beach 99. <laughs> Around 1987, Richard moved to Thunder Bay and helped develop Dillico Child and Family Services, a native child welfare agency providing services to the bands across the north coast of Lake Superior. In 2000, in about 2000, he moved back to southern Ontario and started Hughes Room, a 200-seat concert venue in Toronto's West End. Hughes Room is probably Toronto's premier room for folk, roots, and jazz. That's my own opinion. Um, <laughs> he didn't have to make that. Uh, upcoming acts at Hughes Room include Canadian and international artists such as Jane Bennett, Judy Collins, Loudon Wainwright III, Stephen Fearing, and Fred Eaglesmith. Uh, Richard, we'd be glad to see you at any of those shows. <laughs> 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 Mel Tuck, who was one of the actors who was in the original production of Leaving Home, who now lives in Vancouver, and sent Lynn uh, uh, sort of some of his reminiscences, and I am going to read a couple of them. <coughs> Bill Glasgow called me to be in the show and said, uh, and I said, being young and arrogant, well, I'll have to read the script. <laughs> he asked me who I thought should play Jacob, and I said I thought Sean Solo should do it. And after some haggling, Sean agreed. Then along came the search for Catherine. I read with every young lady in the city. And then he called me and said he had another young lady who had been away in the Caribbean with her mother. And so I went to read with this young lady. And she was a little nervous and she dropped her script. But, and a huge but, she looked at me, she truly looked at me. So after the audition was finished, Frank Moore was in the can to see me doing something like a cartwheel, saying, did you see that? David French was laughing. I found out later that Bill said to this young girl, uh, you are making this very hard. And then she said, it's not hard, just hire me. <laughs> <laughs> so then Bill came back upstairs and said to me, so what do you think? And Mr. Arrogance here said, it's her or I don't want to do the play. <laughs> the rest is history, history and a miraculous event took place. I told David, David French many years later when I left Toronto that Jitters was about me trying to hold the show together. <laughs> like one night when the women didn't want to go on because Sean was drunk. And here I am running down the street.